Uh, it's a pleasure, Jay, to be here, and thank you for inviting me. Uh, if anyone's interested, uh, on April the 10th on our farm, we're having a field day. You are all cordially invited to come and then see, actually see what we're doing and how we treat our land. Uh, one thing I'd like to clarify first, I may say some things that uh, totally upset you. Just think I'm just a stupid farmer. I'm not a rancher, you know. I uh, don't know what the definition is, difference between a farmer and a rancher. Uh, my definition is, I guess, uh, I have 34 landlords with, 20, with 1,150 acres. 23 of my landlords have five acres or less. A normal day of harvest on our farm is taking a header off six times and moving down the road. Uh, another key thing that's kind of fun, and uh, Gabe Brown was on our farm in September. We have 10,000 automobiles go down our road every morning and every evening. Uh, Jay was in a hurry to get back home. Uh, he didn't like all those cars. Uh, this uh, is a daikon oilseed reddish that's, uh, I guess, made me famous, and that's why I'm here. Because uh, these uh, tubers will store nitrogen, phosphorus, and potash uh, pulled up from the soil for our next corn crop. And I guess uh, I've been really privileged this year because uh, uh, the chief of NRCS was on our farm in October uh, and this is where they kicked off uh, the soil health year for the next three or four years NRCS throughout the United States will be promoting more soil health uh, to get more conservation and more uh, production out of the land and uh, lower erosions and lower uh, operating costs so it was a real privilege to have the chief on our farm and I think he told me that was the first clot of dirt he'd ever had on his hands and he was impressed with our soils, you know. Uh, the next guy, this, and I, uh, this I just put up there because when Gabe speaks, everybody listens. When he came to our farm, our normal field days were about 100. We had 412 people show up to hear Gabe. Uh, Gabe, this picture's in my barn and so far since you left in September, we've not had any pigeons come back in, so thank you. <laughs> Uh, Jay called me and says, will you do this and will you just tell us how you began and why you started no-till and where you are presently. So I'm going to be 70 this next, uh, this year and 13. So I'm old enough to uh, reminisce about a few things that we've done. So we're going to reminisce just a few slides here. And when we were doing conventional tillage in the 60s and in 1970, things we had to contend with was sheet erosion. Most of our soils are rolly. We farm from zero to 18% slopes. So we had sheet erosion. We had real erosion from after planting corn. And that was a real problem because we loosened the soil and then it rained and all the seed corn would be in the bottom of the hill. So you didn't have to go very far to harvest it, you know. Uh, but you had to do something with the trenches. And then we have a little bend, a bit of wind erosion. These four pictures in 1970 represents 52 tons of soil loss off our farm. When they told me that at NRCS, I said we can't have that. We began no-tilling. We began with an ACE planter. That was the only thing that was made back then. It was no-till. When I went out and talked to people and tried to get it in the 70s and encouraged how to use a no-till planter, everybody said, how much horsepower does it take? The answer is it's three, you know. So everybody thought when we no-tilled it took a lot of big horsepower, you know. Uh, this is our first no-till seeder. Uh, and I really put this picture in just to show you our terrain. When I go somewhere, I love to see what's around, to see what it talks about. You know, I, I love this area here because I'd never have to take the header off the combine. You could just drive down the road, you know, be no problems. But that's the terrain and that's how we improved our pastures. And it worked. When we were doing this and planting corn in 1972, the only thing herbicide we had was atrazine and 2,4-D. Uh, in 1973, Gromoxone come on the scene and we thought that was a savior. This was my grandfather's first self-propelled combine. This was 1952. He has air-conditioned cabs, height, header height control, and all the good things that we have now. 
And I just threw that in there just to show you how far we have came, come in agriculture. You know. This was our first AC planter. It was a six row. Uh, we planted everything with covers, in covers, out of covers. It didn't matter. We'd feed the cows for a while, take them off. In 1971, we had 200 charlays that calved. We rotated pastures, and we did a really good job with those. Uh, we had 200 cows on 100 acres of pasture, and that would feed them all year long. And in the fall, we'd take the corn off, and then we'd rotate the corn. So that's how we learned to do our beef curd. My boy was home from school, or still going to high school. When he graduated from high school, I told him I owed him a college degree, so he took that. He never came back home, so the cows had to go. Wasn't enough help. Our next planter was a John Deere. We went from an AC planter to this Deere planter because it was simple. Everything was there. It worked. It still good, it did a good job. Here we're planting corn into rye. Here was our next try because International come to me and they said, man, we got a planter. It don't have a fluted colder. It's not going to disturb as much soil. We can plant in clover. We can do anything. So I says, well, just bring her on. We'll try her out. Well, we planted in clover. Uh, got a half decent crop of corn. We forgot about all the mice that was in that clover. They overwintered, planted corn in spring, ate about half the corn crop, you know. So, uh, that, after that year, we no longer planted in the clover. On Dave Brandt's farm, if we have a cover crop that doesn't do what it's supposed to do, we never use it again, you know. Uh, cover crops are no bull. I was in Texas. Throw that in there just to show you that uh, everybody around is thinking about soil conservation and soil health. We always used to plant double crop soybeans because they're greedy. I call them greedy beans. You know, you just throw them out there and you hope you have something. In Ohio, our average greedy bean yields are about 15 to 18 bushel up to the last two years. Uh, so we had to do something better. We just didn't have the kind of soils we was looking for. We didn't have what we could do. The soil kept getting harder. Our corn yields were going down. So then we began working with rye covers. Uh, when we have a mess like this, there's about a week that I don't sleep very well after we plan into it. But you know it always comes up. It's interesting. We find when our rye is that tall, if we can bend it over and crimp it, we don't need to use a herbicide. Uh, here we're planting soybeans in corn, or in, out of our corn planter in 30 inch rows. And here was some of the results. You can see the thatch. You can see how the soil's going to retain all the water it comes. And these beans made 62 bushel to acre. Our second cover crop that we've used ever since 1978 has been hairy vetch. We like hairy vetch on the top of our, our knolls, our hills, because it stays green all winter. It puts down about 200 pounds of nitrogen for next year's corn. So we need to not buy any additional nitrogen for corn. And what we have here is, what I'm after is this fine root system with big nodulation. The, the hairy vetch root system is about four to five inches deep, does a great job to loosen compaction on the top three or four inches of the soil, plus gives us that nitrogen. We found out though we had to keep it out of the flat soils because our flat soils are heavier, we do not have tile systems. We rely on our cover crops to grow out our moisture in the spring. And uh, when we have a uh, wet spring, it's a little tough to plant in that hairy vetch. You're looking there at 25,000 pounds of biomass. This is where I need to lease Gabe's cows and bring them to us for about a week or two and then take them back to him, you know, because there's a lot of good potential protein for cows. Our next choice of cover crops is winter peas. And we're talking about single species because when I'd ask a university or ask somebody back in the 70s and 80s and 90s, they all laughed at us. They said, well, cover crops don't work. We don't really want to help you. So we just learned a lot of things on our own. We like Austrian winter peas. They grow well anywhere we put them. They produce a lot of nitrogen. When I talk about a lot of nitrogen, I'm talking about nitrogen 
where we plant the corn at an inch and a half, inch and three quarters deep. When it gets ready to decide how big the yields are going to be, how many rows of corn on the current on the cob, we have nitrogen there. In August, when it's going to make test weight, we have it nine inches deep. So we have slow release organic ends of nitrogen that the corn plant can use throughout the growing season. I want to make note of that root mass that you see there as a single as a single species. Later on we're going to show you what this roots do when we put another species beside it. Just another shot of the nitrogen nodules. Uh, there's a couple earthworms right there and those are my V rippers and deep tillage tools and my disc. You know. And this is a 14 inch digging tile spade and you, I don't use that very often you can tell by just looking at me. If it don't have a motor on it, my wife says I don't use it. Uh, but at 14 inches deep, we had nodulation in our subsoils. We have about four and a half inches of topsoil that's clay-based, and then we have a clay-based subsoil that's all yellow. These are Cardington soils in Ohio. They're normally yellow-based. Today on our farm, all of our Cardington soils are black. We went from 1973 when I bought the home farm from my grandfather at a half percent organic matter to presently we have 7.5 percent organic matter in the soil. If you can see it, there's a lot of uh, nodules here from the winter peas, but we also have some glues from the earthworms, from the microorganisms, and I don't understand all that. Uh, they talk about these fancy things, I just call them bugs underneath the soil, you know. But I know I need them, and I need lots of them. The more I have, the better my crop is. Whoops. And by having healthy soils, we have healthy earthworms, you know. But this is not a native of Ohio. When I was in Texas, I was working with Jonathan Cobb. Cobb. We took the shovel, put it in his cover crop, out come this 16 long inch earthworm and I said I had to have a picture of that to brag about how big I could grow earthworms in Ohio. So that's a transplant, you know. <laughs> Most every farm we pick up, the first thing we, have, we do to it, we put buckwheat on it because most of the farms we pick up has been poorly degraded or the guy wouldn't have left them. He was not getting a yield out of it. So we pick up where they leave off we put buckwheat in there. In 30 days it looks like this. This is 25 pounds of buckwheat per acre. When it looks like this, uh, and we plant this usually the first week of April, we plant corn on about the 20th of May if we're using buckwheat because we're trying to give it a lot of time to grow and get root mass. So I have two weeks it, while it's in this bloom stage that I can call my beekeepers. The buckwheat cost me about $20 an acre for seed cost. I call my beekeeper buddy, he calls his buddies, they bring 10 hives per acre for however many acres I got. I charge them 30 bucks a hive because you got to remember, you got to think outside the box of how you're going to generate funds because you know corn will not grow in this, you know. So when I can pick up another 30 bucks per hive and there's five hives on an acre, that's 150 bucks an acre, I'm already making money, you know. Then we plant corn into it and probably grow pretty decent corn. Annual ryegrass, we've tried. We've tried it 15 years ago, one time. Uh, that happened to be planted right after we harvested soybeans. It was a month old, went into winter, looked like that in the spring, planted corn into it, turned it brown, took the corn off. A week after we took the corn off, turned green like that again. I thought, man, I got me a cover crop I don't spend any more money on, you know. Next year I planted beans, sprayed it off again, still didn't die. Took the beans off, turned green again, made a mistake, planted wheat. You know. So when that thing come back and bit me because I didn't get any wheat, and everybody tells me I didn't know how to spray or didn't use the right herbicides, well I'll probably agree to that, you know. But that's how I learn. We learn by making mistakes. You know. So I'm really telling you about some of our failures. 
Uh, we're in an urban area. There's an awful lot of human manure. So we take advantage of that. We get them to come after we take the wheat off sometimes. If we need to build a farm very quickly with manure, we have municipal waste come. They put the manure on. I charge them $25 an acre to spread. They said, no, we're not going to pay you. I says, where are you going to go? It's the middle of summer. They come back the next day and offer me 50. <laughs> so we spread every year for them. We let them spread. The last four years I said, you know, I got to have a cover crop. Well, what do you need a cover crop for? Well, if it washes down the stream, then they're going to sue you because you pollute the stream. So you need to buy the oats for me to put in to, to make the cover crop work. You know, you got to keep thinking out of the side of the box when you don't have a lot of acres. You know, when you guys have six or seven sections, it's no big deal. But when you only got a thousand, you got to figure out how to do this. You know, so then we can plant oats in it. Really like the oats, really make good cover. If you'll notice behind there, there's 250 homes on five acre tracks. Every one of them's got a horse. There's more horses in that compound there than there was in the whole damn county when we was farmed with horses. <laughs> Everybody's looking for Timothy Hay. October the 5th, we mow this down. It's dark, nice dark green hay. Guy comes over, boy, I'd like to buy that Timothy Hay. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Four bucks a bale. She's really tickled with Timothy Hay, and I didn't tell her there was, you know. She looked at it, you know. But you've got to make the oats. Because what happens when you put all that sludge out there, and you put all that nutrients out there, the oats go to head. They get three to four foot tall. They fall over. It's a dead mass all winter long. Guess what, guys? You don't plant no corn because you can't get the sunlight down through it. You can't get the air down through it to help dry out the surface. So you need to have those oats short so they start to regrow in the summer and it helps dry out the soil. Because we do not have the ability to put underground drainage when you're renting farms. You know. I threw this in here because our farming operation is on the uh, left side of the picture. Your left. Or your, yeah, be your right I guess. I'm sorry. My left. Uh, there's about uh, 594 acres of watershed on the left. There's about 600 or on the right and about 600 on the left. Which one of those do you want to live beside? You know, this is all the phosphorus, the potash, and the nitrogen leaving my neighbor's farm at the rate of 13 ton per acre per year. That's what I'm concerned about. Dawn of a new cover opportunity. My wife works with me. When I talk about our operation, I always say we, and they always say, well, who's we? And it's me and my wife. Uh, she was a school teacher, so I used to be able to do anything I want to, go to town, buy a piece of equipment. She retired. That ceased seven years ago. You know, so I was telling her I needed to find something to plant cover crops with. And she says, David, I need a new couch. And you promised me a new couch before you bought any more equipment. And I looked at her when I went home that night and I said, I said, dear, I says, the couch is on delay. She said, what'd you do? I says, I spent $100,000 for a corn planter. <laughs> she looked at me and she says, are you going to sleep with that thing? <laughs> you know? And I said, no. I said, the dealer told me I could plant corn, I could plant soybeans, I could plant cover crop, and I could plant wheat. I'm going to be able to run this thing six months out of the year. I said, this is a lot better than my combine that we only run 21 days a year and it's set to shed the rest of the time. Well, that kind of soothes the wills and, and she's willing to forgive me. Last week I did buy her couch because we sold uh, $15 beans. Had a little money left, you know. But the thing that made this so popular was that we worked for a whole six months trying to figure out how to plant two species. Here we have a soybean plate that's 120 cell. Soybeans are a little bigger than winter peas, but the winter peas go right through the plate. So we had to come up with a reddish. The winter peas normally are about 4,000 to 5,000 seeds per pound. The reddishes are about 45 to 50,000 seeds per pound. So how do we get these to plant together? So we worked and worked and made plates and worked with white and 
And uh, the dealer's brother come down from Michigan and he says, you guys are really working awful hard on something. And I says, well, this engineer's here and we're trying to figure out how to make this planter plant these radishes. And he says, well, that's the same size as a sugar beet. Why don't you use a sugar beet plate? You know? <laughs> now, I don't know why my dealer didn't tell me that. You know? So we got a sugar beet plate. It's a 30 cell plate. We got 120 here. Guess what, guys? This implants the reddishes, every reddish seed four and a half inches apart. This implants the peas three and a half inches apart. We end up planting less than a pound of reddish per acre, 14 pounds of peas. We got $17.12 in our cover crop. I can make money when I only have that with our cover. This is what the peas and reddishes look like. This is the dark colored soil that was all yellow in 1971, 72. These are the reddishes. What these reddishes are doing are burying down through the soil. Most of these reddishes are 15 to 16 inches deep by the tuber. The tap roots another 14 to 15 inches deep. About 30 inches of tillage I'm doing with our reddishes. You don't, why do I say we're doing tillage? As the reddish grows in a row, four inches apart, it actually acts like an inline ripper. It lifts the soil three to four inches. So we are doing tillage 20 inches deep, you know. And this is for Gabe because when Gabe come, he, he had this picture of this great big earth mover with a, with a turnip in it, you know. Well, everybody, you know, we have this challenge between us is growing cover crops. And now, Gabe, we're exporting our reddishes because they're big enough to put one in an airplane <laughs> and make a load. So that's how big we can grow them. But here's our peas and radishes. You can see the peas and look at the reddish. Reddishes use a lot of nitrogen, or they store a lot of nitrogen. If you plant reddishes and don't put nitrogen with them, the leaves will be yellow. They won't grow very well. You, I, you remember I talked about the winter pea that I showed you the nice root with, that had just a few bunch of nodules on it. When we put a companion beside that, or another species, more diversity, that's a big word for me, but that's, you know, that's what they tell you that is. And we end up, the winter pretties produce about 40% more nodulation with something beside it. The reddishes get 20% bigger. You know, there's where that reddish was in. Here's, you know, here's 18 inches deep and it was still going past the picture. You know, there it is in the soil. As you can see, deeper tap roots, more water infiltration, reduces soil compaction. There they are in, this, in October growing. The deer love them. You know, the deer hunters come to our place. They like to take those trophy bucks. I don't let them do that. They have to shoot three does first. Then they can take their buck, you know, because uh, Last week we saw 45 deer in a 20 acre field. You know, we're actually grazing something, Gabe. You know. Is there a difference in reddishes? These are uh, five different varieties. You tell me. I sure don't want to pay three bucks a pound if I get something that looks like that. You know. I don't want to pay two bucks a pound if I get one that looks like this. But when I can pay $3.10 a pound or $2.50 a pound and they do this, this is what we're after. There is a difference in seed, guys. So be careful who you're buying from. There's a whole field of them. When they grow like this, we need no tile because we have great water infiltration for next spring. There's what they look like in the winter. It looks like that at home today. It's up to the 40 degrees at home today. I told my wife to be ready because the fire department will probably be there about 3 o'clock tomorrow. When you have more than 30 acres of them things, it smells like a natural gas leak. Everybody's got a cell phone. And they only call you at 3 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> you know? And you know, you got the deputy sheriff and the six fire trucks and three emergency squads sitting in your driveway wondering where the gas leak is. So if you plant these things, you should notify your volunteer fire department so they understand what's going on. You know? Here it is, just the day before planting. Look how dry that soil is. You know, we can put a cow in that hole, Gabe. You know? So, 
But it's really surprising. That soil is so loose. When our fluted colder goes by there, it all collapses in. We've never seen our seed corn too deep where we've had peas and radishes. We've never had a problem getting a stand where peas or radishes are. When we have this situation, it's interesting. We, see, we smell this natural gas leak or this sulfur odor coming off of them. They're actually fumigating the soil. We have less cyst for soybeans. We have 50 to 75 percent reduction in slugs. They tell me I'm not supposed to tell you that because it's not proven. But slugs have not ate my corn for seven years, so I say there's something going on. You know, that's just Dave Brand again telling you what's happening on our farm. How do we know how much compaction they're relieving? This is some kind of thing that, as you push it into the ground, it records. And here was the data. This is corn and soybean rotation five years no-till with cover. This is five-year corn soybean rotation with no cover. If we would look where a chisel plow runs about 10 or 11 inches deep, it took about 50 to 60 pounds of pressure to push a probe in the ground that deep. Whether we had cover crop, and about 150 pounds where we had no cover. If you really want to get bold and talk about 20 inches deep, I don't know that there's a chisel plow to go that deep or a deep ripper, but at 20 inches deep, it took about 170 pounds of pressure to push a probe that deep where the cover crop was and about 300 pounds where we had no cover. So that tells me that we are loosening the soil. You know. That's for one year. That's for one year. This data is the amount of nutrients we can find in our fields after peas and radishes. This happens to be a five year study from five different fields, 90 samples. They're all averaged together. And this is the average amount of nutrients we found in the soil and in the, in the reddish and in the, in the top of the reddish or in the byproducts. 165 pounds of nitrogen, 23 pounds of phosphorus, 230 pounds of potash, some sulfur, some calcium. When we have cover crops, we don't need to worry about spreading lime. We can pull calcium up from the subsoil. There's enough nutrients there. Paul to grow 160 bushel corn or 260 bushel corn. That's why we're not buying commercial made fertilizers and we're not buying nitrogen. You know. It took a lot of years to convince me, but I'm really convinced now that we can do this. We've done it five years running without any fertilizer. We've not seen our soil samples readings going down. We're attempting to plant uh, a little reddish with our wheat. If we can be planting wheat on time, and on time is September 25th to the 26th in our area, and get the reddishes there that week, we can get, count on about six bushel yield increase just by planting the reddishes with the wheat. And this is 15 inch row wheat. The interesting thing, we've done a study now for eight years, 15 inch row wheat versus seven and a half inch wheat with a drill. So far the 15 inch wheat is 7% better than the drilled wheat is, no matter what variety of wheat we use. Here we're planting beans into rye. When the rye is short like this, we need to use a herbicide to take it down. When we're planting into rye like this, you can see how the planter knocks it over. If the planter runs over it like that, and when you have all the press wheels and the duels on the tractor and all that, we don't need to use a herbicide. We can omit one herbicide application. You ask me how it works, the planter goes through there, it doesn't disturb any soil, the beans are down in there, and they really look great coming up. How do we get our cover crops established? We're starting to do a lot of aerial seedings just because we're in a, a lot of farmers in a corn bean rotation without any wheat. David, we can't do this, you do it in wheat. Well, let's find an alternative, let's think outside the box. So we're working with airplanes, and we put our cover crop on just as the bottom leaves are starting to turn yellow. This is a little too late, but this was on the field day on September 13th, and I wanted to show the 400 people that came how we do this, you know. Uh, and the plane's been somewhat satisfactory. It's not 100%, it depends on whether it rains afterwards, those kind of things, but about 80% catch for years is what we had. 
Here's Austin Winter Peace that came out of that airplane. Uh, this was, uh, we sowed them on the 13th of September, harvested the beans the uh, 25th of October, and this was a November picture, November 1st picture. Here's ryegrass and radishes flown on with an airplane and standing corn. Here it is again. You can see that we have a green growing cover there with that corn still standing. What we find if we have a wet spell and the ground gets wet, that cover crop holds up the combine. We can keep right on shelling corn. Here we're just demonstrating that you can plant into cover. I have thousands of phone calls a year. Well, how do I plant into this stuff? Just do it, guys. You know, forget about what's between your ears. Just go out there and do it when it's time. It'll grow. You know. Uh, here's the ryegrass we planted into from the airplane you saw. This was April 30th. There was 28,000 pounds of biomass ryegrass. 14 and a half inches tall ryegrass. Should have been a lot of cows out there first, guys. Crimson clover, cereal rye, hairy vetch, radishes. This fella does this. He's done it now for 13 years. No fertilizer, no nitrogen, and no chemicals for five years. He takes corn silage off every year. He backgrounds cattle. This is North Carolina. That happens to be the watershed for Greenbrier, North Carolina. So he can't till it. He don't dare to have any erosion. Every year he plants a cover. Last year, silage was 36 tons the acre. The year before it was 34. The year before that it was 38. He is thrilled to death that I helped him get cover in these fields. This is just hairy vetch with the crimson clover and a little bit of rye growing in it, just to show you how nice that looks. And yes, wooden cattle like that. You know, wooden cattle enjoy that. Only take half of it. Leave the other half there to protect the soil. Persilia is a new one I'm working with. Seems to be very hard to establish till a year ago. We've worked five years to get a stand. We always try to do it after wheat. Guess what? The soil is about 96, 97, maybe 100 degrees. We had a French intern come and stay with us for three days to learn how we do things. He says we grow persilia in France. We harvest it. We don't plant it till the soil temperature gets down to about 60. Then it grows well. We changed, we went it later in the fall, and it really came on like gangbusters. One persilia plant will loosen the compacted soil three foot deep. That's all it does. It just has a tremendous root system. One persilia plant, you cannot put all the roots in a five gallon bucket. It is just a great rooting plant. Cattle like it, soybeans, or bean, peas like it real well if it goes to bloom. Uh, these are fava beans. Uh, this is one of those, uh, I call it a fart in a mitten. The guy calls up, I've been using fava beans, getting along great. You ought to try it. So I got some. I didn't realize they're as big as they are. They look like a peanut. They really did go through the corn plate pretty well, you know. Uh, they said they're supposed to produce a lot of nitrogen, didn't. Here's what it looked like in the winter. The only good thing to this that I saw out of the fava bean was that when we took a ground temperature an inch away from this plant, the ground was six degrees warmer. And I couldn't figure that out. You know, and I talked to my son and he said, well dad, that dark plant picks up the, the heat of the sun, transfers it, and there was no snow for two inches around those, each one of those plants. So it was warming up the soil. So it's a great thing to warm up soil. So we may reconsider this one to uh, look at a blend to help us do things. This is a normal field of radishes for us. The reason you see them sticking out of the ground, right there it hit the, the plow sole. This has only been farmed no-till for three years. This is the first year we get cover crop in it. So at nine inches, it hit the plow sole, jumped out of the ground nine inches. We dug this plant. The big tuber went another 20 inches deep after it broke through the hard pan. But there was a two or three inch gap in that radish it only had a pencil sized root and then it got big again. Our blends, we're going to talk a little bit about them and I can't say enough about our blends that we're using now because we're seeing soil health improve uh, 
three or four times faster than we can do it with just two uh, species in a cover. Here's the blends we're working with. I met Jay uh, Fuhrer and Gabe Brown three years ago. They got me excited. Uh, called Jay, what do you do? He said, here's some of the things we're using. He says, you ought to try it, David. I said, yeah. Well, did you ever try to find uh, uh, Ethiopian cabbage in Ohio? <laughs> you know, uh, some of those things. Sunflowers, you know, it wasn't too bad. We just went to Walmart and bought bird seed. That wasn't too bad a deal. You know, but these are what, but the interesting thing, look here, first year growth. 16,500 pounds of biomass that we're planting corn into. This is dry matter in the spring from that crop. Our nitrogen fixing crops, about 11,000, which is about five ton. You know, here's a six way blend planted on uh, September 1st. This is a month old. Last year we had four tenths of an inch of rain in August. It still grew. Still grew. Here's the eight-way blend. Here's the ten-way blend. The nice thing about the ten-way blend, we got pearl millet, we got sunflowers, we have a farmer's market. I sent my wife out there because I don't do this kind of stuff. And I made her take the tops off the pearl millet with three pearl millet, two sunflowers, tried to sell it for two dollars farmer's market, didn't work. Come back home, she says that was a bust. I said, well, throw them away, we'll do it different next week. So next week, we put two pearl millets, three sunflowers, and charged five bucks. Sold 250 bunches. <laughs> you know, 250 bunches paid for the freight to get that sun hemp or that, uh, that uh, pearl millet to the farm. Sometimes you gotta think outside the box, guys. Don't get taught, don't, don't have tunnel vision, you know. How do we know how much nitrogen we have in our corn crop? And Paul, this is the wrong time to check nitrogen to find out whether you did a good job or not. Because I say that because look at that ear of corn right there. You know, there's another one. Right there's another one. So what I'm saying is the corn has already, this has made what it's going to make. On Dave Brand's farm, when this thing says 42 parts per million of chlorophyll, that means we have enough nitrogen to make 200 bushel corn. So what this told me was we had 17 parts per million more nitrogen we needed. I either had to have the corn thicker or something, you know, to use all that nitrogen that our cover crops produced. There's a new test out we're trying. Uh, it's called a Savita test. And it is a great little test to find out what's going on. It's simple. It's easy. You go out between the corn rows about five inches away from the corn row. You get a little uh, spade out of your wife's garden. Fill it half full of soil, put that little flag in there, put the lid on it next morning, take the flag out, see what color it matches there. In the back of this flyer, it tells you how many pounds are available the nitrogen in the corn when the corn is 10, 12 inches tall. If it's in this area of three, three, five, four, this is 300 pounds of nitrogen available, 225 pounds, 190 pounds, 180 pounds. You know, this is telling us we're doing the right thing, fellas, to improve our soil health. What's wrong with this picture? Paul's smiling. Gabe's back here jumping around, flagging, you know. What's wrong with this picture is nobody's planned ahead. You know, the belt from the straw chopper jumped off. Oh, that's all right. We'll just put this big old windrow there, 35 foot head. You go out there, that stuff is eight inches thick. You know, first thing's wrong with that field, he didn't try to put a cover crop in it. The second thing's wrong, he's got these windrows. Even if he chisels it, next year he's not going to get a crop in there because that's where all the corn born, that's where all the insects, and that's where everything's growing, and that's where it's wet. This soil's already going to be dry to be able to plant in two weeks before you can plant right there. And guess what our farmers are doing? Get the vertical tillage tool out, ah, that'll work. They come back the area four inches deep underneath there. Five years later, they're bitching because they can't get a crop. You know. What can you do to fix this? Maintain your equipment. Get an even spread out of the combine from the residue. And I hate these 40-foot heads, 50-foot heads, because there's no way 
that you can take a piece of chaff that weighs a quarter of an ounce and blow it 40 foot. You know, they just won't do it. And I think we're doing a big injustice to ourselves by going bigger in order to get done sooner so you have more time to play with mom. You know? <laughs> we want to harvest this corn. Uh, so lights were down a little bit. You would see green residue from the rye grass and radishes in here. But what I wanted to show here was how even that this residue from that corn head and that combine was dispersed throughout the field. Look at that. And Gabe tells me we ought to be putting cows in there. If we had cows here, they could vote in Columbus, you know. That's how far they'd run before they'd slow down. But uh, one of these days, we're going to get ourselves talked into building some more fence like Grandpa had, and then we'll be all right. New things we're trying, crop rollers. You don't want to roll the crop on uh, September 5th that you're going to plant corn in in 13. This was just a demonstration because we had a field day coming. We wanted to make sure that I didn't lie to the people. We wanted to roll uh, sun hemp and uh, pearl millet and sorghum sedan grass and I wanted to make sure it was going to lay flat on the ground. You know, And it did. Here's just what it looks like. Look at that. And that's what it'll look like in the spring. We can roll this crop. If it puts an indentation in the crop, it'll die. So we can get, get away with no herbicide use at all. Again, there's the covers. This was a great field. We had, there's a cover here, there's a different cover here, there's a different cover here, there's a different cover here. Uh, these were all 500 foot wide strips. We do a lot of strip trials. We planted the corn this way. We harvested the grain from that with our yield monitor out of the combine. There you can see it a little better. But there's what we're having in October. So we could get, you know, if we had a fence, just think how many background cattle we could put in there. We could probably run 10 or 15 per acre, you know, put up 100, 200 pounds of meat on them, send them down the road. The things I wanted to show you was, this is my peas and radishes. This is my, uh, basis that I want to fund everything off of because this is easy. Don't take a genius to do this because you just put the peas in one box, the radish in another box, you got the planter, everything looks nice, it's precisionly done. The blue bars are full rate fertilizer which means it's got $275 worth of nutrients. Phosphorus, potash, nitrogen. Peas and radish, 145 with all the fertilizer. Half rate fertilizer, 142. No fertilizer, 143. If I went to my blends, 10-way blend, same deal, 174 with no fertilizer. I'm not telling you not to use phosphorus and potash. I'm just telling you that I know my cover crops are growing enough to make it work. We only had one plot that it didn't work and half-rate fertilizer did better. We hardly ever had a time that full-rate fertilizer was a plus. You know, what does this mean? This is, we took the soil sample and we took the varieties off. This is uh, the blends. Here's the first blend. This is the pounds of nitrogen found in the soil after the crop was harvested, the day the crop was harvested. We had 54 pounds of nitrogen left, 137 pounds of PTO5. We had 87 pounds of potash for a total value. And I just used the value of what I would have had to pay my agronomist to put that on as a winter application would have cost me $194. So my cover crops next year after they've already fed the corn crop, we got $194 worth of nutrients available to my soybeans. Then we go down and it's 270, 245, 223, and my peas and radishes are starting to suck. And that's just exactly what Gabe told me to happen. I'm not bad about it because it shouldn't, you know. What does it mean in a protein sample? Why are we doing all this work to have good soil health and take whatever somebody's going to give us? I'm really tired of going to ADM and saying, what is my bushel of corn worth? You know, my conventional neighbor's corn couldn't even make protein. 8% protein is shelled corn. His protein was 7.5 after doing tillage. This guy burns 36 gallon of diesel fuel from planting to harvest. 
120 bucks an acre fuel cost. Here's my half rate, 6.8. Look here, no fertilizer, average 9.1 protein on corn. If you guys are feeding cattle, buying protein, what would it mean to you to have silage that had one and a half percent more protein? That means about uh, $12.50 a ton you don't have to spend to buy protein to put in the mix. A dairy farmer is $27 a ton, a hog farmer is $32 a ton for his feed. That's an added plus. That's a premium. We need to start bragging about improving the soil health to have better quality food. Another uh, thing we tried, and I'm sorry it's a little dark, but this is a row of corn and this is a row of soybeans. You know, uh, I've never done this, but a guy called me after I talked in Kansas and he says, David, he says, did you ever plant beans with corn and see how it worked? And I didn't answer him for a little bit and he says, are you still there? And he says, what's the matter? And I says, I'm just mad I didn't think about that. You know? So we tried it. So we have splitter planters, so we had some beans left over, so we just planted some corn, put some soybeans with it. Here's what it looked like a little later. This is 22 pounds of soybeans. As far as I'm concerned, they could be bean run beans. They could be any kind of bean because all we're doing is ask a bean to grow nitrogen to supply it to the corn. Look at the color of the corn. No row fertilizer, no nitrogen on that corn. And Paul, this is when it needs it because then you'd see yellow leaves right there if it didn't have enough nitrogen. You know? Here's the great Ray Archuleta. He was just kidding me and really having a fit. He said, this, ain't, this just is stupid, you know. He says, I like it though. He said, somebody's thinking outside the box. And then here was our yields. This was an FFA plot. I really help our young people. The FFA in our chapter has about 50 acres. 25 of it acres we do conventionally. 25 acres of it are no-till. For the past five years, the no-till corns and crops have out yielded the conventional corn by 30 some percent. But anyhow, here's this channel. Here's another channel, another channel of Pioneer with no starter fertilizers, no nitrogen. There was a yield with 140 pounds of nitrogen applied, 300 pounds of 1152O applied. There was the yields. Did the soybeans help the corn? Yes, sir. You know. I can't imagine it helped it that much. This is only a one year test, but guess what? David's going to do a whole lot more of it. You know. Uh, and this is just, I'm just going to thumb through these quick. I just got this information Sunday. Uh, we're working with the Ohio State University, supposedly they know it all now. And uh, so this was the cover crop seeds we're using in their plots. And here's the data I really want to show you is that here was our control, which means it's no-till without cover. These four are our blends. We look at our pH, we're in pretty good shape. We look at the depth, this is four inches, six inches, and eight to 10. We go over here to uh, active carbon. You know, here's, here's the control. Here's the first cover crop. And we made 100 pounds, or 100 points more, or 100 more pounds of, um, Anyhow, we had to buy a bigger number. And all the way through, we had a bigger number. You know, that's what it's all about, people. You know, I'm a believer of having good, healthy soils. I'm not a believer of having uh, crop insurance. I don't like crop insurance. We've never, ever had a crop that didn't pay for itself. Now, we've had crops that we didn't make any money from. But we've always had a crop to make enough crop to pay the expenses. And I think when you buy crop insurance, you're telling me you're betting to lose. Because you're saying I'm protecting myself and I don't have to do a good job of management. You know. And that's just Dave Brandt's opinion and, and I'm hoping that we can get so that we can all grow healthier soils and do away with those extra costs that we don't need any longer. I'll try to answer any questions you have. And I surely appreciate coming and learning about your uh, soils and area around here. Thank you very much.
It must have totally confused them. Yes? What's your average, average rainfall? Our average rainfall during our growing season is about 19 to 20 inches. Our yearly rainfall is between 32 and 36. So far this year, well, in 2012, we had 20 inches of rain for the total year. Right now, we're at a deficit of seven and a half inches. Sorry, I didn't hear that, Gabe. The story about eating with your agronomist. Oh, uh, my agronomist, uh, I've worked with him for about 20 years, great guy. Uh, he loves to sell fertilizer. Uh, so he pulls soil sample. We do soil sampling every year just to see where our, our pH is and some other things going on. Uh, and uh, So when he pulled the samples, I said, I want part of those samples to send off to a lab to Texas because I really don't trust you. <laughs> and uh, he looked at me and he says, okay. And, so, you know, every year in December, we have to spend everything we got so we don't pay any taxes, you know. So he comes about the last week of December, and he says, got it all figured out for you, David. And I said, yeah. So he sits down, and he said, these fields need uh, this much phosphorus, this much potash. You need to spread it in the next three or four weeks. Uh, you can pay me for it now. And I said, well, how much is it? And he said, well, for the 1,200 acres you're going to farm next year, it's going to be $250,000, including the nitrogen. And I looked at him and I said, well, that's great. And I said, let's look at these soil samples. And I said, the sample from Rick Haney showed that we had adequate supply of nitrogen, adequate supply of phosphorus and potash. And he says, well, he just can't be right. You know? And I said, well, thank you. And I said, we're going to spend our money for a new pickup truck, so uh, we really want you to go down the road. You know? uh, so we didn't buy any fertilizer. But it was just, you know, they're trained. These agronomists are trained to sell, and they're trained, and there's nothing wrong with the training. Don't get me wrong. I was trained when I was in VOAG that it took X number of pounds of N, P, and K to grow a crop. They never considered the soil. I think now, as we change soil health, we change the organisms in the soil. Uh, Paul talked about how many pounds of beef he put on an acre when he mobbed graves, and then, I forget it was 50 some thousand pounds or some stupid deal, you know. But you realize that there's 150,000 more pounds of critters underneath the soil? That's hard to believe, you know. This summer, we had 3.4 inches of rainfall during our growing season from May the 1st till the end of September. Our average soil temperature never got above 89 degrees. My neighbor's conventional cornfields got as high as 137 degrees. You know. We never had a corn crop roll all summer long. We had enough nutrients. When we, when we would go out in our blended cover crops and dig, there was moisture in the soil. Now, you couldn't wring it out, you know, it wouldn't drop moisture. We went to our peas and radishes, and it was like digging in a dust bowl. So diversity proved to me by just seeing that this year in the dry weather. Diversity means that's what we need to be looking at. And we just need to think outside the box, guys. We've been taught for so long to have tunnel vision on what we do. We allow too many people to make our decisions. We need to start taking care of our operation and doing the right thing. You know. Any more questions? What are you using for the Ah, uh, right now I'm using a. Well, I use uh, for my precision radishes. I use tillage radishes from Steve Groff because there's only 38,000 of them in a pound. Because he super cleans them. Every seed's the same size. If I'm good at aerial seed, I buy just a daikon radish because there's 60,000 of them in a pound. You know, and Dave Brandt's theory is you never spend more for a cover crop than you can gain back either by yield or reducing nutrients. Why do you want to spend a hundred bucks and only get 20 back? You know, I want to spend 20 bucks and get 150 back. That's what makes money. But Dave, that's why you need well, true. You know, I don't have a completed system yet. I do have the deer that come in the winter, so we're getting close, Gabe. But, uh, you know, I, I just can't, I never thought about soil health till five years ago. You know, because it was all about how I could reduce my fixed costs to improve my bottom line. 
And to me, it's not going to the coffee shop and bragging about producing 300 bushel corn that costs $12 a bushel to produce. You know, it's about producing corn that costs me $1.94 a bushel to produce. And I sell it for $8.50. Now, there's something wrong with this if I can't make ends meet. You know, and we've seen the best times, fellas. I'm hoping we can continue to see them, but I don't think we can keep treating the soils the way we've treated them to see the good times. I just can't imagine a, a dust storm creating a death. That really bothers me. Yes? Um, did you use chemical control on that soybean side dressing? Uh, yes, we used chemical control in that because we didn't have enough ground cover to suppress the weeds. Yes. And you have to, if you're going to use uh, a, uh, a, a secondary plant with the plant you want to have to make cash, you, it needs to be comparable if you need to use a herbicide so you don't kill it. You know. Uh, today, 82% of our 1,200 acres do not get herbicides or bought in fertilizer now. The reason we're not 100%, we keep picking up 5 acre tracks and 10 acre tracks each year. And it's really fun now because guys are calling me, seeing what we're doing, and they want us to farm. They ask us to farm. You know, we have guys driving down the road offering 300 bucks an acre, and I'm still paying 85 bucks to a lot of our landlords, and they're just as thrilled that I'm doing it. You know, because they know what we're leaving for their people that's going to inherit their farms, you know. Yes. So what stage do you take the soybeans? What stage do you take soybeans out of the corn? Uh, well, I was hoping, and since this is the first year, and my finite mind, which is about that big, you know, I was hoping that the corn would grow seven or eight foot tall, and just actually shut the beans down in August, because I was a figured I figured they'd run out of sunlight. Well, the corn never got over armpit high because we didn't have any water. So the beans ended up being about 18 or 20 inches tall with pods on them, you know. But my theory was the sunlight should be shut down by a 32,000 stand and they should suffer for sunlight so they'll probably wilt away. But it didn't work that way. I'm hoping next year it will. Again, thank you very much and I've really enjoyed the afternoon.